Happy Friday, guys, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bill T. Well, it's your favorite air-cooled Volkswagen podcast with episode 284 coming out today, and we've got a banger coming out to you today. But I wanted to remind you, there are three weeks left to go. Three weeks until one crazy weekend, kicking off October 3rd through the 5th at the Orleans Hotel Casino. Make sure you go register today, and this show is brought to you by Impy. Impy's come on board this year as our main sponsor, so big shout out to them, and big shout out to our Impy dealers, Nevada Off-Road Buggy, Dan Volks. Other sponsors are Ross Wolf, Kingstown Shipping, The Wagon, Las Vegas Volkswagen Club, Spikes Vintage Restoration out of the UK, as well as Las Vegas Mini Grand Prix, DJ Renegade is going to be here, and he runs it over there at Las Vegas Mini Grand Prix. They're also giving 25% off of general admission and also hooking you up. If you go up there with your one crazy weekend wristband, you get hooked up double if you bring kids with you and whatnot on Thursday. Also, go check out the Punk Rock Museum. They're offering discounts to one crazy weekend participants and more to come. So get ready, get excited for one crazy weekend. Bring it to you like only Vegas can bring it to you and wait for the strip cruise this year. It's going to be crazy. So we got big plans for you guys <clears throat> and even better, more ways to give away money. That's right. We're throwing out an extra $500 this year, giving out total. So there's going to be a surprise, all surprises all throughout the weekend. So <clears throat> be ready, be prepared and get plenty of sleep because you probably won't get any that weekend at one crazy weekend. So uh, I'm excited for everybody that's being a part of that. And don't forget to support our sponsors of the podcast. BW Trends Magazine, a magazine for the people by the people. Go check them out. They'll also be at one crazy weekend along with, I think we get about 12 or 14 vendors at this point. So we got a lot of vendors this year. So make sure you guys show up and uh, support those vendors. There'll be cool stuff available for you to pick up as well as all kinds of rad cars to see. So now one of the things I wanted to mention to you guys, if you have registered for one crazy weekend for the car show, check your email and look for a registration email from car show pro. Now, if you've already registered for car show pro, you, if you were in the car show last year, you are already on car show pro go put in your, uh, fi fill in for your lost password, the last free email. And then you can go to your car show pro page Upload a new picture of your car, put in any details about it because we are going to be pushing the QR code for people to vote for the top 20 pick this year. So we can make sure that we get a lot of participation on the QR codes for people to vote for everybody's car. So I think that's the best way to do it. You can only vote once and it's awesome and it's easy and you can get you get a cool placard you get to take home with you. That'll say one crazy weekend's got a picture of your car and the QR code tells all about it. So. If you haven't gotten that, go check your email for an email from Car Show Pro. Once I get your registration, I register you for Car Show Pro, you'll automatically get an email. Check your spam or go to carshowpro.com and put forgot my email password and you'll put in your password that you would have registered and paid for your admission with and it will show you <clears throat> it'll show you on there. You'll recycle your password and you'll be able to get all set up. So make sure uh, if you go in there, it'll have, it'll probably say 1966 Volkswagen, and then it'll say enter year and edit picture for details. So go on there, edit. I don't need an email says my car is not a 66. That's what I put in instead of putting zeros. And so go up to car show pro. If you've pre-registered for the show and get your pre-registration, we're working on getting all that stuff. And my advice to you guys would be pre-register now because the lot's going to get full and we want to make sure we get everybody that wants to be at one crazy weekend that you pre-register for the event. So I'm excited. It's it, I'm telling you, it's turning out to be such an amazing event with so many more people coming every year. And this year, man, there's a UK invasion because there's probably going to be six or seven people here from the UK. So I'm excited for that. Um, there's just so much going on and I've got people from all over from uh, Utah, big contingent coming down. From Arizona, huge contingent coming up. From Sacramento, from the Bay Area, from uh, Bakersfield, from from uh, Southern California. I mean, there's there's people coming from all over, and I'm excited to see you guys back here again. So get ready for one crazy weekend. Brought to you by Impy. Now on to this week's podcast. So last week you heard me talking about what happened on the Manx forums and all that stuff, and I got great news. The Manx has been sold. 
and someone applied to buy the Manx to my email and they're going to get the Manx. Not only are they getting a Manx, they're getting a Manx Series 1 before the first 100. And my friend that's going to be on the podcast today went and validated it for me because he know he built tons of Manxes in the 60s. He looked at it, showed me a few things, says, yeah, this looks like the real deal. It's already been verified by another guy. So, And guess what? I didn't raise the price. I still sold it for the same price that all the guys on the Manx forum lost out on. So whatever you do, don't be those guys. Don't ruin a sell for somebody else because I just saw the other day someone said, I'm looking for a, a project Manx to build, meaning he couldn't afford to pay what everybody's asking for Manxes. And all those guys that don't know what they're talking about said my car wasn't a real car and somebody missed out on a smoking deal for a Series 1 Manx. But, oh well, Michael picked it up. Michael's out of West Virginia and it's getting shipped to his place probably next week. So... I'm stoked he got it, and I'm so happy it's going to somebody who wants to build a Manx, who wanted to get a good deal, and who listens to Let's Talk Dubs. Because, man, man, this is the podcast that pays. <laughs> you get buses. I might just start a thing, man. Don't forget, Also, one crazy weekend, there's going to be an opportunity to pick up a 90 show car that was here in Las Vegas, and uh, we'll get into some more details on that later, but... The, all the funds will go, you, you'll have to buy it. There'll be a raffle done through GoFundMe based on uh, $100 donations for GoFundMe to win, to raffle off this car to you. And it's also going to a good cause to help the widow of the gentleman that owned the car. So you'll find out all about it one crazy weekend. It'll be on display and I'm going to go in depth on it on another podcast. But today we're back on the subject of Manxes, Manxes, Buggies, and Tony Vieira. Now, Tony Vieira started a company back in the day called Manx House, 1968. After that, he started a business called, he went in partners with a guy on a business called Bug Formants. And that's gonna evolve into the Bug Formants that we know today. Well, not evolve, but you're gonna see how that connection all comes together. But I'm really excited for this podcast because Tony was referred to me by Nelson Sparks. Now, Nelson is currently working on a book about Myers Manx. He's the one who reached out to me and we discussed about my car which is now Michael's car. Shout out to Michael in West Virginia for snagging the Manx. I just can't tell you how happy that makes me. So anyway, <laughs> so Nelson talks to me and says, you know, don't, do you know this guy, Tony Vieira? He owned a business called Manx House in the Bay Area in 1968. And then, so I tracked down Tony, drug him to the house here in the studio in Las Vegas, and we break it down. We go over the history of bug formats. We go over the history of, uh, the Myers Manx he was building and my and Manx house as well as the Thunderbug, which is what he built. I'm super excited to have Tony on the podcast today and to get a lot of that other history. And as we dig deeper together, you guys and me, as we dig deeper into the history of our favorite hobby, we just keep pulling up gems, man. And I love it that you guys are on this ride with me. I love it that we're all enthusiasts together. So I'm just super jazzed to bring you guys this podcast. So make sure you listen at the end. I got a couple surprises at the end about some stuff you may have seen on YouTube that's going on. And uh, I reached out to some people. Anyway, we've got some great stuff coming up for you guys on the next little podcast. And then also a special surprise guest by my youngest, uh, one of my youngest fans, uh, Carson Hartlauer. That's going to be at the end of the podcast. A little two minute blurb I did with my boy Carson. And he's a friend of mine's son. And he's a huge fan of the podcast. And so we did a little two minute blurb there. So you got to listen to that at the end. It's a great time. But let's get into it, guys. I'm excited. We're going to talk about it. Tony Vieira, Bug Formats, the Thunderbug, early buggy guy on Let's Talk Doves. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. <laughs> Okay, everybody. So on today's show, we know, you know, over the past few weeks, I've put out some podcasts where we've had uh, some some stuff go back and forth about the Manx. And interestingly enough, you know that I'm always a hound on uh, history. And as I was talking to my friend Nelson Sparks, who's writing a book and also, uh, you know, verified to me my, the condition of my original Manx, 
he kept bringing up a name and he brought up a company name. And I said, man, I'm, I'm really familiar with that. And we started talking and that name was Bug Formance. And he told me about Bug Formance. He said, well, there's a guy, Tony Vieira. He's living in your neck of the woods now. And he actually had a dealership called Manx, Manx, the Manx House. The Manx House in Sunnyvale, Cal- was it Sunnyvale, California? Yeah. On today's podcast, I've got Tony Vieira, who is the owner of Manx House and Bug Formance. So I just wanted to give you a proper introduction so people know who we're, who we're talking to here. And I'm excited to have you on. There's a lot of history we're going to cover, but the way that we always start the podcast is, what's your VW story and how did you get into Volkswagens? Um, I was working at a speed shop in San Jose called Goody's Speed Shop. And Goodies. I was into hot rods, nuts, so. And uh, I read this article in Car and Driver magazine mm-hmm. about this crazy thing called a dune buggy. And it was a fiberglass car, and it was running all over the beach. And I lived in California, so I thought, maybe that'd be a fun thing to build. So I um, got started with that, and it became more than fun. It became eventually a, a lifestyle, and um, then I got into Volkswagens from it's, that. So you were a hot rodder, traditional yeah. hot rodder. Now, Goody Speed yeah. Shop's a, a known speed shop from back in the... Was, was this, yeah. This is in the 60s? 60s, right. I worked... Um, Worked there in 66, 67 time frame. Mm-hmm. And then uh, then when I left there, I started uh, started dabbling in uh, in getting involved in the business of... So you saw the Manx and you, th- and you saw an opportunity there. You thought, man, these things will sell oh, like yeah. hotcakes, man. Oh, yeah. And they're super easy. It's not like building a real car, right? This is a super right. easy thing to build. Well, I didn't know it was easy at the time because I was still young. So yeah. actually, that was the first car that I built. Oh, was a Myers Manx. Really? Yeah. And it was an original, obviously original Manx at yes. the time. Yes. And th- there was tons of copies that were coming out at the time, but you wanted to stick with, what well, well, what made you pick the Manx, right? There's a uh, hundred different copies well, and the, stuff out the there. The Manx was the first one and at the time was really the only one. The copies were just coming in and um, uh, the, the article just got me so excited. And uh, like I said, I found another guy who was just had started a business who wanted to build buggies and manxes and he called his company the manx house and Mm -hmm. that was kind of stretching it a bit because he didn't own the name so uh we uh, i got together with him and decided well we need to go into partners and do something a little bit more complete than just buggies so Mm -hmm. we got started with uh, bug formants and then also uh, decided to get into Volkswagens in general, along with uh, with the buggies. Now, and this is up in what part of Northern California? This is up uh, in Sunnyvale, California, San Jose area. The San Jose we, area, and and obviously because of it being California, Volkswagens are just all, all over, over the, the place. place. Yeah. And so you're seeing an opportunity, like, hey, I'd like to get into this, and as well, I'd like to build Manxes, but we need to we need a little diversified income stream. Correct. We need bugs. Yes, we need this. We need it. that. How'd you come up with the name Bug Formants? Um, just, um, I guess, creative uh, license <laughs> um, at the time. I uh, I think I'm the one that came up with it. Mm-hmm. Just putting together Bug and then Performance uh, to kind of put it all together because we figured that Dune Buggies was a little bit more trendy. Mm-hmm. So that we wanted something that was going to last a long time. Well, which, it, it did, right? Obviously, Bug Formance is still in business today. Well, that's technically been some iterations, and we'll and we'll, we'll kind of get to that history. Yeah. So, give me the history. So, how long is Manx House? Is it House or Haas, like German? Just, uh, just House. Manx House yeah. So, Manx House is in business for how long, or oh, is it a very always... short time? Um, I'm going to say less than a year. And did you? go meet Bruce and do all the stuff directly with him or it was all mail order Did, or what? didn't work with Bruce. It worked with uh, one, a, a manager at the time, which was, uh, I believe it was Rick Belden mm-hmm. and um, set up the dealership, but we didn't get into the dealership. Um, actually bug formats was started in 1968. We didn't have an official dealership until probably a year and a half, two years later. And uh, the, the, the industry was already expanding, lots of copies. Um, Bruce was running into problems with um, uh, federal regulations, uh, excise tax, and uh, copies being copied and copied, and he was trying to sue and things like that. 
so we got in kind of sort of late mm -hmm. um but we had been doing manxes for other people who would bring us a kit and then we'd build their car for them and how long take good. you to build out a car oh uh it would a little bit depend because sometimes it was not a rush sometimes it was a rush which would be a month or two and then easy. you guys would start with a scrap bug and just take it, take the body off, cut the pan, do all that yeah, stuff. We did everything. I, mean, I had a really good um, mechanic, uh, Rod Schertz, who uh, did all the cutting, did all the. Uh, in fact, he did he did some unique stuff. He put he put an angle cut on the pan instead of a straight cut. Oh, Most, like Z cut it. Yeah, about, yeah, yeah. And uh, from from the from the center part to the rear corner. Uh, oh, really? Instead of straight across, most all banks pans were cut straight across. So if you so Shortened. if you find your pan and it's got a Z cut in the shortening, it, it would it would it be was from probably bug I mean, uh, or Manx I don't know who else might have done it that way, mm -hmm. but we did. We cut it. That's interesting. And, and so when you guys did it, you weren't a dealer at the time. You were just a, a retailer or a mechanic shop type stuff. You didn't have to have a special dealer license or anything, did you? No. I actually, I did have a dealer's license, but mm -hmm. we didn't have to. And you guys would pick these cars up. Now, would you leave them all mostly in gel coat? Like the gel coat was good enough Absolutely. to just cruise it oh, like that? that was beautiful. Yeah. So it was kind of unheard of to, to, to paint them? Paint them, never. Really? I never painted a car, never. Wow. The gel coat was always uh, pristine. Yeah. It was really nice. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I summarized on my own thinking – Bruce's history comes from building boats, and boats have got to be really mm -hmm. strong. So you get Bruce building these Meyer Manx, and he's technically overbuilding them compared to Manx copies or other fiberglass cars that are really... I mean, even I owned... At one time, I owned a VW Puma, which is a fiberglass car that comes from Brazil. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the fiberglass was so stinking thin on this thing. I mean, the Manx that I have over here, the fiberglass is really, really thick on it. And uh, I think maybe that I, I would think that because of his training coming from the boat world, he would build things really thick and sturdy compared to some of the other kit cars out there. I don't know. Yeah, no, it was a very good car. Uh, no issues. I mean, you, you have a little minor this or that, but the uh, the thought process, the creativity, the engineering and it was artwork. It was just beautiful. And so you're coming at the tail end as, as he starts to get trouble with the supply and max all stuff. And now you've got still a customer and clientele base that mm -hmm. wants to bring you cars. And obviously yeah. now did you start, you were selling the Manx bodies yourself. Like we'll, we we yes. we, you bring the kits in stock. Now what would a Manx sell for back then? A kit? Um, boy, I, I don't remember pricing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, I want to say seven ninety five for their complete kit, mm -hmm. which was like a windshield and dash frame and so what would you get a complete pieces. so they come to you this guy says i want a complete max what's it going to cost me oh gosh back then was less than five grand yeah like we could do one <laughs> for turnkey turnkey for stuff. a turnkey car yeah and with with manx kind of being where they were with with bf myers being where they were in the evolution of their business and you guys getting in Obviously, people were bringing you these other cars and stuff. Did you guys switch to dealing any other fiberglass cars that you sold? Uh, only one that we actually built ourselves. Oh, you did? We did build a mold. Um, we called it a Thunderbug. There's about 40 or 50 of them floating around. I have I have one. Um, if, actually, I found one that's uh, unbuilt. I just found it. Really, and I'm putting it together right now. But there's the, it, it. We we took what Bruce um, built uh -huh. and uh, did what we thought was the best little improvements we could based right. on the little idiosyncrasies from the Manx, mm -hmm. like where the uh, where the gas fill comes out, um, and uh, and just did a, a, a some minor minor changes and uh, had a nice car. And so the Thunderbug, which was the kit you guys built, was it like a Manx copy or you guys took artistic liberty to make it completely it, different? It, it was not completely different. So mm -hmm. it was very, very similar, but it wasn't a copy. Uh, we had a little different shape on the fender. We redesigned the hood so that it was stronger. And again, the, the gas tank fit better. Um, we didn't use a steel frame dash. We used a thicker, um, beefed up, all fiberglass dash one piece 
where his was multi-piece, we did a one-piece. So you did a one-piece. Now, yeah. did you ever build any of the Manx SRs? Yes, we did a couple of those. Well, that seems that, that seems like a pretty complicated. Uh, much it, more complicated. It's much, much more, more of a real a was, real car, right? Yeah, we 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 struggled with the doors. We struggled with the hinges and getting everything straight so they'd close properly. And uh, that that was a more di difficult car with side panels and everything else. But, and so you were dealing with a distributor you had your own you had your hands full up there in northern california being a, a distributor and seller of that and then built the thunderbug how come you only guys you guys only built 50 copies you said 50 copies yeah well it, again it was late so the trend was was going out and then uh, actually in 1977 um i ended up selling bug formants to uh to my my uh, manager at the time bill brister bill brister yes and he's he owned the original uh, bug formants for about thirty five years. And then did he end up selling it to Bob Hole? No, no. Uh, Bob and uh, well, I had hired him and another gentleman by the name of Bruce Cranick. So you knew Bob. You I knew Bob. Yeah. Bob worked, it worked. Didn't work for me. He was in the, he was in the service and he was a customer. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came in and was a good customer. And uh, then he mostly worked with Bill on buying the name. Okay. That was the deal. It wasn't exactly a franchise, but right, it was right. a, uh, let me use the name, uh, help me with suppliers and uh, things of that sort. And um, I don't even know that the, the time frame on that was probably in the 80s that yeah. Bob got involved. Well, what's interesting is I, so I've interviewed um, Ron Rosevere who started Otto Haas. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what what he does. He'd get somebody that's working for him, and they just kind of, they either want to quit or they're, they're going to go start their own thing. He says, yeah. we'll do this. Go start an Otto Haas, use the name, and I'll supply you. And then mm -hmm. he became a distributor for all, yeah. Yeah. all the guys that of going to competition with him, which seems to make some sense, especially at that time. You know, we're, t we're going back to the time when your phone number was important. A lot of oh, people gosh, named yes. their business A1. It would it would be A Reliable Tile Company or A Bug Builder, A Volkswagen guy, and then the, the next guy say I'm going to go A1, and then th that's where all the A1 numbers come from. And, and and what's funny is maybe a lot of young kids today don't realize when they see a business called A1 whatever, mm -hmm. that's an that's an older method of the means of of marketing for a phone book like where people would actually Correct. go to phone yeah. books and stuff like that so i i think it's neat to you know because what, what some people would do is if a guy went out of business for whatever reason they'd buy his phone number yes because oh, yeah. the phone yeah. number would just generate business yep. and this is before you know obviously the way we market now with the internet and all that kind of stuff it's it's really interesting to see how those dynamics have changed but how those particular things affected what people named businesses mm -hmm. for, for marketing mm -hmm. standpoint. So, but so getting back to your story, so you sell, you sell bug formats in 77 or you yes. sell it out to your partner. Yes. Now, what do you go do after that? I mean, cause, cause obviously uh, what makes you decide what, what's the, what's the deciding factor where like, I'm kind of tired of this or you didn't like being partners anymore or what, what was the reason you decided to sell and just move um, on to something else? Just, um, uh, a, a situation of not knowing exactly what to do next. Uh, it seemed like a fad. Was successful. Well, bug formants in mm -hmm. general was a, was successful mm -hmm. because by seventy five or so, um, we had gone through a, uh, a oil shortage time in seventy four. Right. That's right. And we had done pretty well during that time. Uh, other businesses had not, um, and uh, so business was good. Uh, I had uh, Bill, my counter guy, was anxious to do something else. I figured I was going to lose him anyway, and he was a, really enthused to buy the business. So it was like a marriage made in heaven for, or a divorce made in heaven. I don't know what you yeah, call yeah, that. Yeah, an <laughs> and, 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 and split and, where you could. Yes, uh, and yeah. uh, we've been, in fact, we've been uh, very, very good friends for many years because we did, we did Pikes Peak together. I used to build build some race cars and things like that. But um, that's that's basically it. So he's responsible for bug formants really for um, the, the last 30, 40, 30, 40 years. Now, so. does he still own a bug formants? No, he closed it um, 
uh, I want to say six years ago, maybe something like that. Economy. Uh, and Bob, know, just... and Bob, Bob started his version or branch of that by saying, Hey, can I, can you license me the name? Can yes. I use your name? Yeah. I'm in a different market. We're not really affecting each other. And yes. there's no better way to establish business than to just come out with a branded name like yes. that. Now you leave and do what? Um, actually, uh, I did nothing other than build race cars for about a year. And now, then are I, then you I, a hands-on guy? Oh yeah. Well, I was, uh -huh. yes. I used to do, uh, we built a couple of Pikes Peak race cars and off-road race cars. I did quite a few chassis and suspension. Oh, setups really? And yeah, yeah. So you you moved fun. in. So so the buggy thing started with you, and you thought, man, this is cool. Then you got a little taste of the off-road. You thought, yeah. let me get in the off-road thing and see what's what's doing. Well, over I was here. actually I was doing the off-road thing in 1968. I went to the second Mexican 1000. <laughs> really? Yeah. So What'd I did that. What did you I drive? I did that along with bug form. It's, we we had a. Uh, uh, a car called Wallabug. It was a tube frame car that we built. Wallabug. Uh, Wallabug. Yeah. Nobody ever heard of that. And then I, then I was also a dealer for. Who built the car? Uh, I, we, I did. So you, could, you just looked yeah. at it and said you saw someone building a car, and you said, oh, well, we, I, I think we can build something better here, here, That's and here. That's right. Oh and, yeah, I was always into that. Were I, you? I could always do something better. I was sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, sometimes yes, sometimes no. <laughs> right, right. So you build the Wallabug, mm -hmm. and then this is a tube frame car. What class did it run in? Or was it just well? It open was classes? basically only two classes, I believe, at the time, in the sense of. Uh, 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 two seat uh, you know i don't even remember but uh uh i think there was only two or three classes like four wheel drive and two wheel drive and open and that's about it um and now so. um so you start racing on like on your own i mean you've got you have a day job while you're doing this doing something else to bring no, in the just, money just bug formants i had bug formants at the time because okay. we started bug formants uh after or excuse me, right before I went to my first race, which actually the first race I went to was the Stardust 7-Eleven in Las Vegas in 1967. You know what's crazy? I've grown up here my whole life, and the the, the, the Stardust racetrack yeah. has been gone since before I started driving. And I don't even know where it was, like where it used to, because you now you now live here in Las Vegas. Yes. And and I that's a part of Las Vegas where there was so much going on in the sixties and seventies that the Stardust, I don't know, was race complex or drag strip or whatever it was. But uh where where well, would that have been? Well, I, I don't remember street names from way back then. Right, because there was being just dirt in Las roads. Vegas now is if you take Tropicana mm -hmm. out about probably four miles, five miles out of town, west. that would have been yeah, west. That would have been the racetrack. Now it might not have been Tropicana. It might have been Flamingo. It might have been right. Charles. It wasn't Charles. But, but in the sixties, when you drove two miles west of Vegas Boulevard, there was nothing. There's there. nothing. It was just just oh, desert. A mile. A mile. <laughs> we 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 tested our car in back of the uh, in back of the uh, um, can't think of the um, in back of the Stardust. We tested yeah. the car in back of the Stardust because it was open. Yeah, the, be, behind the Stardust, you have yeah. the railroad tracks, and then yeah, that's open, and then right. nothing. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. And so your that, that's the first race you did was the Stardust, Stardust Seven Eleven, then the Mexican One Thousand. The Stardust Seven Eleven. Uh huh. That was seven hundred eleven miles, and it was just a big loop here in in uh, three, Las Vegas. Three hundred and fifty five and a half mile loop, <laughs> <laughs> and that's wild. And you did that in a VW powered. We did car. that actually in a non-Manx buggy. Um, oh, really? At that time, we we what year uh, is this? We that had you did I that? had some connections, and uh, a guy, local guy, was building these knockoffs, uh, Western fiberglass, and uh, he offered me a body. He says, "You do my body. You run the Stardust Seven Eleven race, which nobody had ever heard of." And uh, I said, "Okay, great." So I built. I built a car, and that was with another guy at the time. And Jack he was Kimber. building fiberglass bodies. He was building some bodies, kind of dune buggy yeah. bodies here in Vegas. Yeah, Western fiberglass. Uh, actually, it was in California. Oh, he was San in San Jose area. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just it was a, a, a knockoff at the time, which yeah. was very pretty rare. Pretty yeah, rare knockoff. It was an early, early knockoff. Well, the, the you know the Beetle Barn bus that you saw that I have that was yep. uh, Warren Stevens. When he started that company in 59, 
you know, he did a bunch of, obviously everybody that starts in, in Volkswagens, especially if you're there right in the heyday of the sixties and seventies, off-roading just explodes mm -hmm. into that yes. whole thing. So when, when you do, what's your experience like when you, when you run the Seven Eleven? how does that go down? Uh, well, that was the first time I had ever done anything like that. And it was, uh, a, a mind blowing experience an epiphany, if you will. <laughs> was it just, was it heat. groomed, uh, like, like no, groomed trails no, or it was, was it barely a trail? It was, it was, uh, uh, colored stakes posted out in the desert and you had to follow the stakes except we were slow enough that we didn't follow stakes we followed trails and dust and yeah we spent uh we spent 23 hours on the first lap on the first lap of a two lap race <laughs> you, you had some you had some and some we were breakdowns uh, well not necessarily breakdowns but just holdups um a flat tire, a couple of flat tires, I think, uh, oil leaks. We, we, we banged the, uh, Volkswagen engine so hard that the skid plate Im embedded itself in the, uh, in the fins on the in, bottom In the fins on the bottom. Yes, yeah, that's right. And it caused the, uh, uh, the plate, the drain plate there to, uh, it cracked it crack and started leaking. And, yeah. Fall. So we fixed those things and finished or finished the one lap. And uh, it was so so grueling. Did you finish the second lap? So just... grueling. We didn't even start the second. You were like, forget this. Forget this is it. miserable. And, uh, what we found out later, obviously, you don't know what's going on, but there was about 140, 150 entries, and we ended up like 35th. Was there were like that many 35th, 30. Yeah, that many people like DNF'd <laughs> on that thing. Wow. Yeah. If you didn't DNF on the first lap, I think it was only 10 or 15 finishers on that first race that's crazy i don't remember all the details i i got him i got it at home i saved i saved the all star, my paperwork the stardust 7-eleven <laughs> that's i mean that's why you know and, and and for me being a again with the whole podcast thing i've turned into kind of this history buff of our hobby and i just think like how wild because a lot of off-roading started here in las vegas before southern california because oh, yes. i mean this is the wild west out here yeah. there's you know old wagon trails and all kinds of stuff out here um so you, what was your experience like doing this? So hold on. So you do that race first, then the Mexican 1000, you don't finish the seven eleven. You're like, you know what? I think we're going to do the 1000. That's right. That's what that's it's in your blood. I got addicted at that point. I really did. I can do this better. I know how to build something different. I can do it better. And that's what do you, what do you run in the Mexican 1000? What are you driving in that? You're, you're doing, we a, had, that was the wall of bug okay, at that point, that's right. which was a tube frame car. See, we knew we had to, and we had to do better. So we on the 7-Eleven was a tube frame car or was it a... Uh, no, that a was a mag, fiberglass a buggy chassis copy. buggy car. Yeah. So with that thing car. going through the real hard rough that oh. just twists the whole oh, chassis. Yeah. It was not It was not uh, anything like what you would expect it should right. be. So that's what the object of the Wallabug. Uh, unfortunately, we did not finish the 1000. We had the motor mount breakage and... It was just a difficult situation. How far, and, and was that when they started down in uh, down in La Paz and yes. went up? No, it was. It started in uh, Tijuana. actually Tijuana and uh, ended in La Paz. How far? We did made it, it about a third of the way, and uh, it, it, we just had so many problems trying to keep the engine in place because we didn't mount the engine transmission correctly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, d there was no support. And those years, there was absolutely no support. Like if you're you broken, you're nothing. Yeah. And we didn't have anybody that we took down with us. It was just my partner and I. <laughs> we, you think about that. We well, hold on. You've lived a lot of years. You yes. think to yourself, right now, if someone said, this? hey, buddy, let's get in this fiberglass 40 <laughs> horse car here. Or let, let's get in this two. I made this we car had myself. We 53. 53 horsepower. Yeah. Excuse let's me. get in this 50. Why don't you do this? Let's hop in this buggy. We'll bring a gallon of water and let's <laughs> head through the desert and see if we can make it a thousand miles. That's, no that's, support, no nothing. That's pretty close. That's, that's pretty close. We took it down. <laughs> I borrowed my father-in-law's pickup truck because I didn't have a truck. And we put the buggy in the back of the pickup truck and took it down and that's that and left the truck in Ensenada because we were going to drive back. Well, yeah, because you're thought you're yeah, winning this thing, right? That's not, right. Not you're going to place. So you're going <laughs> to win. And when you realize you're in trouble, like how so you just hit you just hit this huge dip and you just bottom out the car and yeah, well, it just um, it, it it just wasn't put together right. It vibrated and uh, um, 
you know, looking back on it, we could we could have finished. We could have kept going. But I think the the overwhelming thing it would have been about thirty or forty hours at least. Yeah. At least uh, that's if everything else went well and things weren't going well at the time. So, and it was and it was a situation where we had to drive the car back. So, um, you know, it, it, you you just learn what you learn what racing and winning and all that's all about with those early experiences. And so you. Uh, how do you get out of it? You're broke down. You have no support. How do you? Well, you're now in the middle. Did you? Were you actually we made near it to, a town? We made it to a checkpoint okay. where there was a whole group of people. Other teams had people, so, and everybody's really good off road racing. Everybody to to the to the person will help you do whatever you need. Yeah. And there was guys there with welders and you know machinery equipment, uh, so we were able to pit paste it back together. So we could get back to uh, our truck. <laughs> so, so you just turned home. around and drove home. Yeah, got on the highway this time and said, no, "There was this. no highway. There was no highway." Well, true, true. Even no today highway. in Mexico, there's there's so we, no highways. We in had a lot to of go places. back to the race course, which the hold the on. Highway, so you're going, you're going, you're going. Up. Well, it was just after the race was <laughs> <Okay>. over. <laughs> after the race, the the, the uh, pavement ended about I want to say 15 miles south of Ensenada. From that point, it was From all that dirt roads. Point for the next seven or eight hundred miles was dirt, was desert or dirt. Just so when you're racing, you trails. might come across a family driving in a pickup truck and just have to go around them type yes. thing. Yeah, or a turtle truck. They they used to haul turtles back and forth from Ensenada La Paz. Um, like turtles, the actual turtles. Yeah, for turtle soup, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so. Was, you, the Mexican 1000 doesn't go as planned. What's your next venture? Um, well, let's see. Racing-wise, um, I ran the um, Mint 400 uh, and then several races, the Parker 400. Now, I st- were you I still racing. in Volkswagen-powered cars, or did you move on to— Volkswagen, always oh, really? Volkswagen. And then, unfortunately, my, my actually official uh, driving uh, racing days ended because I got an accident preparing for the 69 Mexican 1000 and I broke both wrists and uh, pelvis and fractured Holy skull. Holy cow. Um, what happened? We were um, actually taking photos for the uh, San Jose Mercury News because the Mercury News was doing an article on the crazy people going to the Mexican 1000 in 1969. So we were up taking photos with them and for them and driving back to the trailer my partner at that time who was driving the buggy went off the road, um, which we were up uh, in the in the hills to have some background, mm-hmm. uh, off-road looking background. And uh, he drove off the road down a cliff and uh, we didn't have our seat belts on. Holy moly. So, you know, word to the wise. Like just kind of <laughs> off the road, just a quick yeah, little accident. I, he, uh, went, he went out the side of the buggy and he broke his wrist and and they had some other issues. I went out the front of the buggy and landed on my hands. Hands. So that is what I got from that. And this one was in a ca- both were in cast for three months. And I broke wow. my pelvis, which just had to heal. I was yeah. in the hospital for three weeks, and he was in the bed next to me for a week. Good grief! So I was good I grief. Was, so, and so so that- I I got I wasn't racing for a while, but I was sponsoring. Bug Foreman sponsored several off-road race cars in the in the period from 1970 through 76 and what uh now you, so you, your racing days are over mm-hmm. now what what do you decide to do after that well i build race cars and go to go to the races as uh as the pit crew and so you uh, you stayed is, in the hobby oh absolutely on another level through what I'm, company through well i still had bug formants through 77 Okay. Then after that, I started a company called, I, I did, I guess I dabbled for a year building just cars and mm-hmm. things like that. And then I started Truck and Travel Incorporated, which was a company that dealt with the newer trend of uh, van conversions and truck and four wheel drive equipment. Oh, really? So that I had that company going uh, for quite a few years. In fact, it's it's still officially going, but it's a management company at this point in time. Anyway. Um, so the van thing started van, catching. Yeah, on. we did a lot of van conversion, private 
um, we'd work uh, not as a uh, what they used to call a pool converter, which would sell to dealerships. We would work individually with dealerships if they had a customer that wanted a custom van or four-wheel drive equipment, lift kits. Lift kits were big. starting to get popular, big, yeah. big stuff at that time, and um, bumpers and grill guards and roll bars, things of that sort. Yeah, and, like, uh, well, was, well, like what they do with good. four-wheel parts today. It was just like a right. smaller my, version my, of that. My number one competitor that that made it very difficult to continue on with business as as truck and travel because they opened a store in San Jose and I was in Sunnyvale. Who was? Tr- f- four wheel parts? parts? Wholesalers, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah, I mean, that business is business. Yeah. And I was small and they were big and uh, so they were undercutting prices and it was difficult to keep up with them, which we, we did, we managed, mm-hmm. and we did okay. And uh, uh, But then I decided to... Uh, um, move on from that after a while because the 1970 I went through the 1979 gas shortage and that was a struggle yeah well and uh well but because then because then you're working on all v8 vehicles right so nobody's buying vans or big four-wheel drives anymore they're all looking for for something else that's way better on fuel no we'd be sitting there with the crickets going off in the back shop sometimes and uh so we but we made it through that again um and then uh in uh, 1990, when the Mideast War was bubbling around, I decided that gas shortages and oil was a real detriment and uh, got involved in a bar. They decided to buy oh, a did bar. You? You thought, I know I'll do. I'll go into kind of the uh, for the food service bar restaurant <laughs> industry. That's easy, yeah, right? So that's, that's what I did for about 11 years, which was fabulous. It was a great investment. And... Um, and then uh, in 2001, I sold the bar. And uh, since then, I've been able to do the stuff that I really, really enjoy. Mm-hmm. So, which is work with collector cars and some Volkswagens too, and uh, uh, get to drive some uh, um, nice, nice cars for test driving purposes so now you said you've got connections to so how did you get connections because you were telling me bruce canapa you do you you work with him and some people like that how did you end up getting into that that whole thing i'd known bruce uh, sort of as a just on the side for a long time i'd built a couple of uh pikes peak race cars and he'd race pikes peak and um just knew him because he was in the area and and he's an uh, kind of an outgoing guy. Everybody knows Bruce if you're mm-hmm. into cars in the area. And um, just um, one of his, uh, well, his uh, shop manager at the time um, called me and uh, said, uh, I got kind of a job that you might be interested in. And are you doing anything? I said, well, no, I'm not at the moment. And that was early 2000s. And um, he said, uh, well, Bruce needs somebody to test drive some cars, and would you like to do that? And I said, well, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And uh, so I got involved with that. Plus, I had I just had bought a two-car trailer for doing my own things and got involved with some collectors. And, of course, Bruce, being in the collecting business, had connections. So I uh, ended up uh, test driving cars and um, hauling not really nice cars around for some uh, collectors very nice people um we'd go to shows and do 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 um, a variety of things and so for the, them so as you start getting into this you, we talked about this a little bit off the air uh you know that's kind of my retirement plan with my wife i told her i'm gonna yeah. we're, we're gonna use one of our trailers and we'll just long haul cars everywhere and just see the country and just kind of do it that way what's uh what are what are some of the Anything specifically unique or really wild that you've hauled as far as cars? Uh, I guess you would say, yeah, um, two Ferraris. I took down to the 60th reunion, not reunion, but 60th anniversary of Ferrari selling cars in California. And I took two Ferraris down for an unknown uh, collector. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were um, a very exclusive uh, Ferraris that had won in 1960, like race cars, one and uh, 1959 and 1961 Le Mans race, 
uh, Ferrari Testarossas and uh, took them down for the event because Ferrari had contacted um, owners of all years, all 60 years of Ferrari. So they displayed one car from each year of Ferrari. So these two cars represented 59 and 61. Wow. They were, uh, they were insured, uh, needless to say, not by me. Right. But they were insured for $90 million. Holy cow, 90 million bucks. Yeah. So you've seen some, probably some pretty wild collections. Yeah, yeah. Some very interesting cars. What is the what What is the strangest car you've ever seen? That uh, like you, I mean, you're a car guy, right? So you've seen some. Yeah, what's What's the yeah. biggest surprise? Like, holy cow! I've never seen it. Like any cars you've run across in someone's collection that you just were blown away by. Oh gosh, that I can't even. I can't. That was been so many. I don't. It's hard to hard to pick one out. Um, Have you ever seen any of those Chrysler turbine cars? Uh no yeah those no, are pretty I haven't. wild uh, yeah. I guess I I guess you'd have to say it's more a matter of a collection that is very impressive mm -hmm. um look everybody knows about Jay Leno I've been there um for that collection Seinfeld 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 I drove I've driven two of Seinfeld I gotta cars. get uh, listen I gotta get Seinfeld on the podcast to talk yeah. about Volkswagens I really. I, you know, he does a podcast with that spike, uh, spike something or other, but they talk mostly about Porsches and stuff like that in a little bit. Yeah. But I would love to get, uh, to get him on the podcast and talk Volkswagen because Volkswagen. he's sure. got a, he's got a collection. He's got a couple cars that, that were built by people that I know. And so it'd be interesting to, um, you know, have him on and just talk about where does his, uh, you know, like where's the desire? Cause you know, a lot of these guys, you know, and now that I'm thinking about all this stuff, all these beautiful collections you see, I'm, I'm actually embarrassed you walk through my garage because my garage, because <laughs> my garage, I've seen these collections oh. where I walk in and it's like, it's immaculate. I, I was at the upholstery shop one day. Oh no, this and, is this is heaven in here. And, and a guy, heaven. oh, this is chaos. Yeah, my my one buddy's restoring to my car comes in here. He says, my he says, I he says I couldn't sleep. And you know, with this garage like this, like, is he, but he's real meticulous, right? Yeah. But he's in the UK where they don't have space, so right. everything's got to be right where it needs to be. But I remember I was at the, I was at an upholstery shop one day, and I'm I'm picking up some fabric, and you know, I, I like to fashion myself to be fairly handy, and I usually kind of do things that are good enough for me. I'm talking to this upholstery guy, and he's telling me, oh, I can probably do some of your work for you. And he says, well, you can come by and take a look. I work out of this shop in this place, and so it's like. Not in the best area of town. It's here in Las Vegas. And there was a guy that owned Channel 3 News here, Jim. Jim something or other. He passed away recently. And he had two warehouses that had to be 100 by 100. And these had one side was all sedans and all sedans. The other side was all convertibles. And these were cars for like every year. And the, every wall had gigantic, probably at least six foot wide, eight foot tall movie posters all the way around the whole thing. And every car was lined up in like a perfect, in a perfect row. And it was so wild because like out of the blue, I'm going to this no name building really un you know, you wouldn't know there's anything in there and you mm -hmm. walk in. It's just a massive collection. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of people and I've watched some people collect. There's a, there's a collector here in Las Vegas that owns some dealerships. And because I'm a contractor, I work with, a contractor that they work with and they flew in a bar from Ireland from like the 1800s. They wanted to rebuild this thing in, in his shop. And I walked in there and I'm looking at the collection. You can usually look at someone's collection, kind of figure out what they're into and nothing made sense. And what had happened was he had started getting into collecting, started going to Barrett Jackson and just started buying just random things. And the collection didn't make any sense at all. And he, he owns a Ford and a Porsche dealership here. Now the deal, now his collection is primarily Fords and Porsches and he, it's gone 180 degrees, but it was funny to see the original collection. And you're looking at things like, why would he buy that? I'm thinking maybe I had too many drinks during the auction. <laughs> Cause I mean, there's some, there's some funky stuff, but I tell yeah. you, you know, you, you look at these collections and one day I'd like to have a shop big enough to house all my cars. Or I was telling a friend of mine that I said, I just don't know why I can't be happy with just one, one car. You know what I mean? And, uh, I, I don't know what it is. Now, do you have, Bill, you, you, Bill <laughs> I don't have a collection and a long time ago, I don't know when a long time ago, I decided, uh, in certain, in a certain sense, I didn't want to own a lot of cars. Right. 
Bec- but but what I'd like to do is just rent your car for three days yeah. and just just play with it, just do it, and here here's your car back now and get it out of and your that, system. That's exactly what Bruce Canepa offered me to be able to just here's a car, go test drive it, yeah. and it was cars that you'd never dream that you'd ever own. But on the other hand, it was just fine with me that I didn't own them because I got to drive it. And uh, it we great. get the best part, right? So I don't have. I have a couple buggies. Unfortunately, I sold my original Manx, which was a, a first series. Uh, I wish I had kept that, but I have uh, a couple of what's called Wampus Kitties, which were pretty rare, yeah, the unusual Wampus car. Kitty. And uh, I was also a Wampus Kitty dealer. Were you? Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, and then I found this Thunderbug, and then I have a '66 El Camino, which is a another um, another part of your your emotional life from uh, high school and college. Because yeah. I always wanted an El Camino, and '66 well, a good year. Of, it's a good looking. It's kind of more yes. more of the squared well, off I, ones. I originally owned a '66 396 SS. Yeah. And at the time I bought that, I was 19. Believe it or not, at the time. I wanted an El Camino, and I got talked out of it. So this is this is the um, end result. I finally got my El Camino. Never had one. Well, I shouldn't say never. I had a '72 for a while. Um, never had a '66 El Camino, and uh, I found one in the back of you know the the typical thing sitting in the backyard for 20 years under a tarp. And uh, original owner, original nice shape, like like no. So you no. had re, you, you did, have you did you it's do a full restoration? Completely or? done, yeah, full restoration. How long did that take? Uh, that took a long time because I bought it right before COVID, mm. and uh, I worked with a guy in San Jose who's a Chevelle Camaro guru. Like that, he's the guy. He's the guy. He's the perfectionist. He's the guy you want to work on his car, and I uh, all but all but got down on my knees and begged. Uh, and uh, he 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 got hooked uh, because I knew that's what it was going to take. I had to I had to hook him on on doing the job, otherwise it wasn't going to work. And now they they didn't guy. they didn't make. When's the first year they did an SS El Camino? Would it have been seventies. SS was seven was sixty uh, seven. Mine is not an SS, but I put the SS equipment on mm-hmm. it. I upgraded it in the sense of building it stock building it original because it was a 396 four-speed bucket seat car wow so i did it original but it did like for example didn't have air conditioning so i did put air conditioning in it modern air like like a new style yeah yeah and we put four-wheel disc brakes on it disc brakes weren't even available then and uh or we got the front front disc might have been an option but i don't think so and you drive the thing around here in vegas yeah Mm -hmm. stays cool yeah yeah well I, i i don't drive it very much because if I got an ignition issue with it, and it really just got done. Uh, I brought it here about six months ago, and I'm still kind of driving it, working the bugs out of it. I got an ignition problem. We're gonna we're gonna switch ignitions because I tried to keep it too stock, and that's too stock is sometimes too old. Well, yeah, the mo- modern ignition. I mean, they have modern those ready is, to run MSDs yeah. that just drop in. So I'm just uh, waiting on somebody. He's uh, gonna help me change it over. Nice. Yeah. No, you listen, you've had a, you, you've had quite a storied, uh, history in cars and, and, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the, the gig you do with Bruce there to be able to drive some really rare Porsches and stuff like that. And I, I mean, that's the perfect gig. If you could do that is to enjoy it for a couple of days and then drop it off when it's about time to mm-hmm. adjust the clutch and do, <laughs> yeah. and do yes. all that stuff. Like yeah. I'm done with it now. It's oh, like having a brand new car was, for a couple of days. That was the fun part. When, when he, uh, when I started working with him, actually I started working through his operations manager and, uh, they didn't have a sheet. They didn't have a test drive sheet. There was another guy before me that was kind of retired. He was a retired an older guy didn't know much about cars and they'd just get him to go around the block and down the street for a bit and he'd come back and kind of tell them maybe something wrong or not and uh, me being a car guy I decided no if I'm going to do test drives I'm going to do something important for them so I put together a test drive sheet 
Yeah. And the mechanics there, the tech guys, love that. Yeah, because they know what to take care of. Because I would go through it, and it would be a reminder for me because I would make sure to try everything, you know, make sure this switch works, that light works, the dome light, does the dome light work, does the tail light work? So I'd do the all kinds of tests, and I'd come back and give them uh, a pretty complete report, and uh, and that was the fun part. It was the fun part. You know what? This thing's falling apart. Here's the keys. Let me know for the next next when you get it all done, and I'll take it for another test drive. Now, wh- how many cars do you think you did that for? Oh gosh, several hundred. Several hundred. I'm gonna say two hundred. I'm gonna say two hundred. So yeah. for those guys that don't know who Bruce Canop is, he's one of the uh, probably the, one of the most high-end Porsche restoration guys. He does some other cars too, mostly Porsches. Yeah. Strong in Porsches, but a lot of different cars, a lot of unusual cars sometimes. Yeah. He's had, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh gosh, lots of Mercedes. Actually did lots of 300 SLs. Oh, really? Yeah. The yeah. early ones? And earlys and uh, gull wings. Uh, he was, he's big into motorsports. He actually has a separate division that's uh, Canapa Motorsports. Right. And um, uh, he did um, one of the early um, Rolls Races, a mm-hmm. restoration for uh, somebody. But uh, if you go into his shop, it's very eclectic. He's got a museum. Very nice. Yeah, so you've so you've had your fair share of seat time in just about everything, yeah, huh? Yeah. Of all the cars you've driven, is there any of them you, you thought, man, I, I would love to own that? He did a restoration for one of his special customers, which was on a 300 SL Roadster. Mm-hmm. 50, I think it was a 58. I might be wrong on that. Anyway, uh, they upgraded it um, motor wise. They um, were, it was putting out about 330 horsepower out of the six cylinder motor. Wow. He put a five speed gearbox in it, uh, upgraded the brake systems, put air conditioning in it. Uh, cause that's, that was a downfall of, of 300 SLs. They were hard to keep cool. Uh, the cabin was always like the, hot. like the earlier so, Porsches, the eighties Porsches, yeah. the air conditioning is just, yeah. Anyway. And that car just ran and drove so beautifully. It was a dream. Really? It was a dream from the fact of this was the car to have in 1958. Yeah. This would have been the absolute dream car to drive huh. and and that's that's a good feeling because you know torque of that six cylinder motor and uh, and then the five speed so it's fairly quiet on the freeway yeah air conditioning so, so in your collection that you in the cars you have now you've got the el camino you've got yes. two wampus kitties yes two yes uh, actually i had three i sold one <laughs> Uh, one of them is a you is a different kind of wampus kitty because it's got a volkswagen front end on it so now so Wampus, what's built. the story on Wampus Kitty? What, what, I'm I'm not into the buggies, buggies and the at all. yeah okay. I, I I don't know you know I'm I'm a VW well, guy. Funko um, was put together by a guy named Gil George, who uh-huh. was a uh, an untrained, brilliant engineer. That's, yeah. that's all I can say. And uh, he was a hard guy to know, uh, but once you got to know him and got to understand what he was doing. Uh, you were a believer, and a Wampus Kitty was an, the actually first, uh, what I would say, production off-road race chassis, hmm. because he started building them in 1966, 67, hmm. and the uniqueness of it was uh, it had a single A-arm front end, which... A uh, single A-arm? Yeah. Like a was, lower only? Uh, a, um, a one only. <laughs> <laughs> a middle, <laughs> just an, a middle arm oh, that yeah, went yeah, yeah. up and down. So it decambered and cambered just incredible, yeah. which makes it look like the car couldn't possibly handle, except it was an off-road race car. It wasn't built for pavement. Right. And his concept was he wanted to build a four-wheeled motorcycle. So the car was very lightweight, a 1,000 pounds, uh, and Volkswagen motor, rear rear mount so you didn't have the front end on the ground very much and um and they uh they didn't get the success they should have because uh it took some time to work out the bugs one of which was volkswagen spindles broke 
very easily. Yeah. And with the articulation of the front camber um, and the fact that the speedometer, uh, the speedometer cable went through a hole in the in the spindle and connected to the wheel hub it was kind of a weak was a weak point. Made, it, made that spindle the left spindle weak and so it got a bad rap from that to start with and then to save even more weight he built aluminum a arms for the front and uh they were the first aluminum a arms were made with the wrong uh alloy wrong material so those broke and uh, so it got a bad rap and never made it too far in the sense of winning races. Uh, a couple couple uh, races were won. Herbst had a car. Mickey Thompson wrote, drove one, one race. Uh, some notable people uh, were. were and it, had, it was built with round and square tubing? Uh, mostly all round. Yeah. A little bit of square for the center. Center. And how did they how did they figure out that front spring tension with the coilovers? The coilovers in the front? Uh, yeah, they were um, they were um, motorcycle shocks. No, they were um, Monroe rear load levelers. That was the rear load levelers for a car. Really? Yeah. And and so what? <laughs> and then, so then, what made you go after those? Did you did you drive one? In the, in I the drove one. Days? And the, at the time, you got to remember now. This is all based on the time frame. Sure, in the sixties, the car would go. Twice as fast as a Volkswagen car, Volkswagen buggy. Yeah. It, the front end articulated was uh, eight, nine inches of wheel travel, which was unheard of. Yeah, it just eats unheard up everything. Of. And the car would go by you, uh, uh, just zoom, and it was lightweight. It was a four-wheel motorcycle. So think about a motorcycle. Uh, at, in the early days of off-road racing, motorcycles were unbeatable. You couldn't yeah. drive a car as fast as a motorcycle. Now that's changed a bit. Uh, now, but uh, back then, motorcycles were far, far faster. Well, yeah, that's the the the, the biggest thing that's changed off road racing is suspension. Yes, suspension yes. has changed because they've never they've always been able to make the power. Yeah. It's just make the power, keep it, keep the car together, and and mm -hmm. get it through. And you you know you got some of these, you know I've had a, I've got a couple off road machines, and I've got I had a one of those new can abs, and it's just like those things just they that's just. It. I mean, I went through. That's what it's all about. I used to go to Mexico. I used to be a group leader. And we would take a lot of the um, trails to. Uh, we we would drive down to Bay of L.A. and then back, mm -hmm. and we do it mm -hmm. over a ten day period, right? So we would drive, stop, eat tacos, do whatever. But we would go from. Uh, we'd drive into San Felipe, and then from San Felipe, we'd stay the night at um, up on the hill, up on top there, the ranch. Oh, uh, San Diego, not San Diego. Um, Mike's Ranch. Mike's, Mike's Sky Ranch. Sky Ranch. So we yeah. stay at Mike's Sky Ranch, and from mm -hmm. Mike's Sky Ranch, we drive into uh, Mike's Sky Ranch, gets you over to the coast, yeah. mm -hmm. and then we drive into Mission Santa Maria, mm -hmm. and then from Santa Maria, we go to, uh, it's right in the middle of the peninsula. It starts with a C. I can't think of the the name, but it's kind of the middle of nowhere. Oh, there's Ojos Negros, there's Mulahe, there's... Um... Oh, I can't. Uh, yeah, I know. I know who you know what you mean too. Catavina, Catavina, Catavina. So yeah. we go to Catavina. Yeah. Stay which there, used to be, which used to be called San Inez, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. And so we would stay there, and that's literally the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And we cross over, and then go to uh, Bay of L.A., and then from Bay of L.A., we'd wrap up, and then come up the the inside peninsula, the Gulf side, back over to San Felipe to go home. Mm -hmm. And Port I remember Portocitos. Yeah, and I remember taking that ta take the three sisters over Portocitos without when it was not a road. Well, we would go through. They got a place over there called Horse Piss Canyon. Okay, that we go through, and uh, that comes up through. Um, who's the old guy? Had a place on the corner. Yeah, um, Coco's Corner. Coco's Corner. They call it. So Coco's Corner. You go, and then you just head straight back to San Felipe. But I remember back to suspension. I mean, I'm, I'm going through Whoop Road, which is coming out of Bay of L.A., and it's three-foot whoops, and I'm 45 mile an hour straight across top of the whoops. And it's insane because the car weighs the same as it's 1,800 pounds, same as a stock VW, yeah. but the suspension Benchy, right. is just it, it's just insane to be able to do that. And, uh, yeah, you know, and, and as you see outside, I just, got, I just picked up a um, Mazone sand car out there just – 
a friend of mine was getting rid of it, so I picked it up because it had a twenty three thirty two in it with forty eight IDAs. I thought, ah, oh, geez. it's cheap enough. Let me get it. And then you know, <laughs> I need a project like a hole in the head. But yeah, it's 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 wild this this Volkswagen hobby that evolves. And you've got a pretty wide breadth of cars that you're into between the El Camino, which is probably something that ties you back to your childhood. Kind of yeah, yeah. The, the, exactly. the 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 car the cool guy in high school was driving. Right. That's oh, it. Oh, got it. That, that's <laughs> dream. That was a dream yeah. time. And <laughs> well, the funny part is for me, it was like the dude with the pink bug with the beat grooves yeah. on the window. That yeah. was my high school era. It's like, <laughs> or the guy with the mini truck. Like, those guys were the coolest, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, capturing that essence of what was so cool to you back then as a kid is, is just so fun as far as the car hobby and, and just trying to track down some of those things. But you, how did you find the Thunderbug? Because you said you have you have one Thunderbug that's built and you have one yeah. that was unbuilt. And that's yeah. the car that, th- those were molds and cars you were building back in. Uh, yeah, yeah. My Sunnyville. son actually found it um, that was in the San Jose area, which was where we were at when we were building them and selling them. And somebody had bought uh, the the body. Um, I don't know who it was, but bought the body, the kit that we sold. Bought a '75 Volkswagen, had it shortened, um, uh, and was ready to assemble it, and never did. Really, never did. Never got. Never drilled a hole in the body. Never drilled. Never bolted anything together. It's all there. Now, doing all that stuff that you were doing back in those days, did you ever have any problem, like with bug formants, with copyright infringement from Volkswagen, and get those letters and all the stuff that people used to get, where they said you can't use the name "bug" in your name? Oh, I think we were number, we were right up there as number one with those letters. Oh, really? Uh, we got uh, letters, and actually, Bill, the fellow that bought bug formants, mm-hmm. had to get a lawyer, had to get an attorney. Oh, really? Because they wouldn't, they wouldn't. Uh, yeah, they wouldn't uh, um, honor. Uh, they, they they wanted him to quit using the name Bug, and a number of uh, businesses we had heard were all sued pretty much at the same time. Well, yeah, and, same thing happened. And all I can tell you, all I can tell you, is it cost Bill a lot of money for an attorney, but needless to say, he won. Yeah, well. and that was beating Volkswagen at maybe their own game. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean they definitely. Uh, they definitely had. Um, and, and what's interesting is when, so I, as I've been piecing together history, doing these interviews and all stuff, I'm thinking that started happening in the mid '90s, because they were going to release the Beetle again. Yes. Yeah. And they really, I mean, because I know early on, my friend Justin's dad was served with a cease and desist to use the name Beetle Barn. Well, he had been in business since 1959. Volkswagen didn't incorporate the name Beetle until like '68 or something like that. And so that was kind of the era where, you, but when you're a small business, you get a cease and assist from, you know, big, big power attorney company. You know, it's, it's definitely kind of uh, a little bit intimidating. Mm-hmm. Now talking about the Thunderbug, when, when you, so you guys design your own kit, you build it. What was it? I'm looking at a picture of one here on the internet. It's got a type three engine in it. Did you guys do it for type one motors or you did it for no, like, what did you do just, to make yours different? We didn't do a lot. Manx was a really good, we, we didn't go in competition with Manx. Right. We went as an alternative. Mm-hmm. That's what we thought. We had an alternative, you know, you got a BMW, I got a Mercedes, mm-hmm. uh, that kind of a thing. It, it, we tried to be, we tried to, to build, continue with a good quality car. And here's an alternative to the Manx. And it's a little, it has a little different, features to it you know the ridge and the hood uh the fenders are shaped just a little bit different we use the uh we use the stiffeners underneath the uh the fenders but everybody thought those were for for a wiring harness no it was a stiffener that's what bruce put underneath there right the tubes keep the fenders from flexing they call them the tube right yeah we did we didn't i i really didn't know the details in in the uh, how Bruce went about building uh, the fiberglass, but our fiberglass guy, which was real good at the time, mm-hmm. uh, who did the mold for us and everything, uh, we asked him to do the initial layer in uh, handlay, and then do cho- a light chopper on the flat parts of the car 
and a heavier chopper on the edges of the fenders. Mm -hmm. And that way, it, again, it gave it a little stiffness, a little firmness, a little solid. Somebody stick their hand into the fender. It was real beefy. Um, and, you know, we did, did some things like that. Thought, thought, thought it through. And uh, had, we, we thought we had a nice car. Unfortunately, what happened is when I sold the business, the, of course, the mold went with bug formants. And uh, through our, the fiberglass guy quitting, the mold got moved around. The mold got actually moved to the uh, Central Valley, California, and then the mold disappeared. Really? Yeah, so we don't know what happened to the mold. So it got moved, when you say central, like Bakersfield type area? Um, like Fresno, around there? Fresno. Fresno, area, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And so someone grabbed it from him, like, because it's sitting at a fiberglass we, shop, and the yeah, fiberglass shop just goes out of business. We don't know if the fiberglass guy did it, because we weren't building very many cars. I, I, I should say we, meaning Bill, wasn't building hardly any cars at all at at the point in time. When in you the, sold uh, the business. Well, early 80s. So buggies early. were kind of on the decline, decline. at that point. Decline, yeah. Yeah, they went, they went quiet for quite so, a quite a while compared to today so, like today if you could find that mold that would be fantastic would be to be able fantastic. to rebuild those cars it would be fantastic but yeah. uh how would it, now did you ever see the molds that you had made oh yeah yeah and is there any distinct thing that somebody says if they ran across the molds they would know it or no. oh well i'd know the car but it could be a copy of the original car <laughs> who knows right, right. who knows at this point who knows yeah. at this point but we did the thing that would be unique uh, that was a little different than Bruce did is Bruce used a tube and fiberglass a tube in under the cars. Mm -hmm. We actually made a mold of the shape of the fenders front to back. And that was a separate fiberglass piece that was shot up separately. Uh, we do the first layer of chopper gun. Then the, then the uh, tube was laid in or that other piece of fiber that's right. made, and then they'd chop her over that. Mm -hmm. So it was actually built into the to the body. So like you the, you the built tube. the fenders separate off the car, and then no, 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 not the fenders. The, so the tube, the, the tube part was it wasn't a tube. So you embedded it was it into embedded. The... Yeah, it was embedded. It was shaped like the fender. They actually took a mold out of the inside of the fender. Mm. And then made a mold. So then you made a that. reinforcing panel that yeah. you then it, that you epoxied to the car or it, yes resin to the car resin itself. The car itself. So it, it when it attached to the underside of the body, it was already stiffened. It was hardened, already stiffened. And it, all you, that. you hardly even noticed it. It didn't. It didn't look like a tube. Right. It just was a bulge. A bulge that that shaped that followed the, the shape. Yeah. Ah, that's interesting. Because I mean, obviously, with you guys building so many, you've found you know ways to improve them and, yeah. and kind of, now those things i've i own one i've never driven one i don't have one that you know has been on i have driven but it was a long time ago it was a four-seater manx and it was a rickety you know kind of thing once those things are built pretty nice are they fairly stiff and solid and oh and yeah dry pretty good very solid i really? mean they're a so, they're like a brick it's like it, it, it's it's like if it's put together right mm -hmm. Because it all has to be bolted together. It can't. It, there's no rattles. There's no. Should be no rattles. No squeaks. No, anything. It should be nice and solid. And it's they're they're like a brick because it's only a ninety inch wheelbase. Did you ever do a full length car? Not a Manx. No. Yeah. Um, no, never did. Not, not a full length fiberglass buggy. Let's right. put it that way. Yeah, this um, it's it's a cool looking car. This one I'm looking at on the internet's got like kind of an orange flake to it. Did you guys the gel coats never came in a flake or they came in oh, a yeah. flake? Oh, yeah. so you yeah. could flake a gel coat oh, too. 30, there's, I may be wrong here, but I believe it was like 36 color flakes at the time we were doing it. Oh wow! And uh, it was only a few solid colors. Actually, it was more flakes than solids. So the flake would go right into the gel coat, like right yeah. into the, yeah. the finish the finish coat on the finish car. Finish coat that would be the finish coat if you if. Uh, the, the flake was such, for example, if you had an orange flake mm -hmm. and you uh, sanded it, you would sand through the clear part of the epoxy or a clear part of the gel coat, and you'd, you'd start sanding the flake, and then the flake would turn silver because the orange flake was actually anodized uh, aluminum. Oh, it really? Was orange anodized aluminum. Things like that would happen, yeah, when somebody would get too too crazy with 
So the flake was all part of the deal. The flake and the gel coat was very thick, very thick. That's why you didn't paint them. Yeah. The objective was never to paint a Manx. That's never interesting. I'm wondering. I think my. I think the one that we'll go out and look at mine in a minute. I think yeah, my, lots. Lots of them now are painted because uh, there's you know scratches and dings and cuts and and people accidents ruin that. fix fix that so on and so forth. My Manx unfortunately got a got a dent in the front fender. Uh-huh. Uh, it wasn't very big and it was repaired, but they couldn't ever match the paint color correctly. Now your your no. the, the so your buggy that you have your Thunderbug so you you have two you have a Thunderbug I have one, just one Thunderbug right now which is in process of getting getting put back put together so you're put building the first a time. brand new one yeah <laughs> and what uh, what color is this one red just a solid red a solid uh, bright red guards red mm-hmm. I don't know what you'd call it because yeah, yeah. it's gel coat I don't remember the color name. I'm going to have to come by and check it out. Yeah. <laughs> you see my <laughs> stuff. I got to come over and see your stuff now. But uh, I think, uh, you know, it's funny because, you know, I bought the Manx as something. I bought the Manx because it's money in the bank. And I thought, I'll buy it if, because I have an old supercharged motor that was uh, a motor that's a, it's historically significant in drag racing. And, and I have one of my issues of Hot Rod Magazine that I have has a on the cover it's two guys and it's an it says isky cams on the side of the buggy it's a purple buggy metal flake it's got a single 48 ida coming out of the top middle and i just love i love a cover shot to a magazine that depicts like a scene guys working on something or whatever and um i thought oh maybe i'll take that supercharged motor it's a lee Layton supercharged motor and I'll kind of build that buggy metal flake the thing and then put that motor in the back and just kind of have a, a tribute car that, you know, it's mm-hmm. got this old supercharger motor in That's it. Just, it. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny because now the more I kind of learn about the history and the, and the scarcity of the things, I think like, oh, the car deserves to be built. Am I the one that's going to build it, or can I find somebody that will just build it and and they can enjoy it? Because I like the idea, but as you've been to my my place here, I got a few things going on, and it's like <laughs> multiple projects. Yeah, Bill. the last thing that I need is another fly to swat, right? So, um, but yeah, I think it. I I think that the whole world of that that build your own buggy and you kind of live that whole thing because you went from buggies to van conversions, which is mm-hmm. like the natural evolution of like, Hey man, I'm a car customizer. I love doing it. I love, yeah. you know? And so the question I ask you, you just pulled up in a brand new stock truck. Is it going to stay stock? Yes. <laughs> Cause it's your tow yes, rig. It's, it's, it's fine the way it is. I'm happy with it. It's, it's electronically a whiz bang that I got to figure out all the bells and whistles. And uh, it's just going to stay the way it is. Uh, I, I've actually, noticed that. Yeah. Actually, I always had a vehicle or vehicles that I didn't do anything with. Uh, early on, something in the, my mind said, you know, then you have to have a vehicle that you don't play with because the one you do play with may not be ready to go when you need to go. So yeah. it was a balance. It was always a balance. No, I think it's I think it's great. Anything else that we didn't touch base on that you you might want to mention before we wrap up? God, Bill, it's we've got. Well, you now you're local, man. Right. I'm gonna yeah. expect you to stop by and uh, love to and <laughs> and shoot the breeze. And we're gonna have to I'll, I'll, for sure have to come out to one crazy weekend and check I'll, it out. I'll throw some ideas at you. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. I love it. You know, because you know the thing is, there's there's so much there's so much to this hobby and so many. I mean. Did I ever think that I would be interested in buggies? No. And and here I have an interest in it because when when I wrap my mind around what was going on at the time and I take it and I put it in a context that I can understand like in today's world, right? Like where a new where you remember the SEMA show, every year you go to the SEMA show, there's the car of the year. Mm-hmm. And I remember there's a year it was the PT Cruiser, it was the yes. Chevy HHR. Like whatever car came out that was the it car, there's never been an it car that's lasted longer than the VW or VW platform. That's, it was, that's it. Yeah. it was always a car that it stemmed so many different levels of the hobby that it's like you have Manx pages, you have buggy, you have buggy websites that are just committed to the history of different buggies. And they tell you, you know, I remember, uh, I, cause I chase Volkswagens all the time. So I was driving through searchlight Nevada and I saw a bug for sale, pull over to buy it. I go talk to the guy in the rafters upside down he has a Dean Jeffries, okay. Stinger, Stinger, Coyote, Coyote, 
He had a coyote because they have the funky headlights that kind of integrate yeah, into yeah. the front slope right. nose. So it files in the mental file bank, right? I met my buddy, my dentist, and my good friend. I'm at his house and we're talking. He goes, man, I really like to get a buggy. I said, you want a buggy? I said, I know where there is one that's never been built or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And sitting in this guy's rafters in Searchlight, Nevada. Pick up the phone. He goes, builds this buggy, puts a 1.8 liter Type 4 in it, tooling it around. Enjoy. And he's he's the guy that builds everything. Like he built the whole thing, had it done. And he thought, ah, oh, you know, I haven't driven it in a while. Started sitting in his yard for a little bit because he's a car guy. And, you know, some things get neglected after a while. And he says, what do you think I get for that buggy? thousand bucks? I said, no. You can get four grand for that thing all day, no motor. He's like, really? You think I can? I said, yeah, because you just got to know your market. You got to know who you're selling it to because there's a guy that's going after every single, like the, there's the coyote and then there's the, um, the what do they call it? The, the, uh, the, 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 there's like the, 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 the one that there's Dean Jeffries and then there's Keith Dean. Uh, or kid like kid Dean is his son and uh, he built a car called a Shiloh or a, 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 it was like a shark something. And there's been so many different types, but you can find somebody and my buddy, I ended up selling his coyote for like four grand. Somebody snatched it up the second I put up for sale because they're looking for those cars. That's it. Yeah. You know, yeah. everybody's looking for these original glass cars that were made back in the day because there's just something cool about it, you know? And there's been so many iterations and, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I love to see how many rabbit holes this hobby goes into because it goes into so many from oh, there. Yeah. I've been a car guy all of my life. Uh, as early as I can remember, I had car mag, tried to get car magazines and used to count license plates and all, all <laughs> kinds of stuff. Um, from day one and it just never it just never went away it's it's an addiction yeah it is it's, it's a, there, there's a problem there yes. so yeah. <laughs> well tony i'm really glad we got to sit on the chat it's this has a pleasure, been bill yeah, fantastic great. for me i i love the history um we we did talk for a minute about you looking at cars and being able to tell so you've built so many manxes like you can look at a manx and tell if I, it's a real I manx. probably can i'm pretty sure i can because yeah. uh Unless somebody's really chopped it up or changed it a lot, yeah. But, um, well, there's a lot of there's a lot of different. There's a lot of little variables. clues, yeah. Yeah, how the well, shape of the of the uh, license plate area is. And, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, interesting. Well, this isn't the last of us doing something like this because there's oh, good. when you get when when, so. when you get that buggy done, I'm gonna come <laughs> do a video of your buggy and we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna talk about because there's something to be said for like you're in a market. Great. I like buying these Myers Manx they sell. Wait a second. Myers can't produce Manxes anymore. They're having trouble. Mm -hmm. I got to do something because I've got a market and I can fill a need. So let me build my own car and build the Thunderbug. That's right. That's you know? right. So I love Amen. it. I, I, I love all of it. So we'll be definitely doing something again. And thanks for coming on the show. You bet. Man, oh man, I love that it keeps getting better. We just keep getting deeper and deeper into this VW history. And I got more after talking to him. I got a couple other links. So we're going to be digging it up, getting that history, talking to those that did it. Now, this week you may have seen a video on YouTube about a guy talking to another guy saying uh, he was brought into a warehouse and saw the uh, MP Inch Pincher one, all that stuff. So it's a pretty interesting video. Well, next week we'll be uh, talking about that. We will have Dean Carson on who's writing a book on uh, the history of MP and uh, Econo Motors actually. And we're gonna be uh, we're gonna dig deep into that, so um, I'm excited to I'm gonna be recording that next week with Dean, so maybe out uh, the week after, or who knows. But I've got Rusty uh, Rusty Steering Box coming on here, so Rusty NL Rusty's dot NL. So go check out his website. Also, three weeks left to go, guys. Three weeks until one crazy weekend, sponsored by Impy. So don't forget, check it out. Book your Pre-register your car now and sign up for the poker run today. So we're excited. I'm looking forward to it. And it's going to be one crazy weekend. And I'm excited to see all you guys out there. Now, I want you guys to give a couple minutes to my guy, Carson. So check out Carson's podcast. It's about two, two and a half minutes. And it's a good time. So I know you guys will appreciate it. And we'll be right back after this.
Happy Friday, guys, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bill T. Well, today we're hanging out. It's a Saturday, and I'm kind of kicking it with the Las Vegas Volkswagen Club, and we got a special guest in the studio. I've got my guy, Carson Hartlauer. Carson, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Now, you're a big fan of the show, right? Right. And what do you like about the show? I, I like it good. Your dad is a Volkswagen guy, right? My dad's a Volkswagen guy. Yeah, we had to talk about how school going. Yeah, so how's school going for you? Just started school. Going good. Yeah. My, my teacher's name is Miss Shapley. Yeah, that's Johnny cool. Johnny Shapley. And then... What's your plan? Because I know you like Volkswagens. Your dad has a Volkswagen. Do you plan to get a Volkswagen one day? Probably. Yeah, you think? What color Volkswagen would you like I, to have? I, I'm gonna, I, I need to say the aide. Yeah. So my aide is Mi Miss Melody. Yeah, who's that? My aide who helps Miss Shapley. Oh, that's your aide in school that helps Miss Shapley, right? Okay. That's cool. And so what, uh, how old are you? Nine. You're nine. And what grade are you in? Fourth grade. Fourth grade. So... so so I have music on Monday. Yeah, I have PE Tuesday, Wednesday. I have R and Steam on Thursday. I have Library on mm -hmm. Friday. Yeah. So the principal's name is Mister You Took. Yeah. The Simpson principals, Miss Garen and Miss Neiman. Yeah. So you like going to school, right? School's fun for you, yeah. Yes, yeah, school's fun for me. That's cool. And do you like because um, you know this is a Volkswagen podcast? I know you're a Volkswagen fan because your dad listens to the podcast all the time. Now you, when you get older, what kind of Volkswagen are you gonna get? I'm gonna get the. I'm gonna get the Volkswagen. Like a bus, a bug, or a Gia. A, a a bug. Yeah, you like a bug. And what color would you like that bug to be? Black. Black. Nice. Like my dad. Yeah, your dad's got a black bug, and then uh, your grandpa's a Volkswagen guy too, right? Yes. Very cool. Well, anything else before we wrap in, we go back to the swim party. Anything else you want to talk about? Talk about school. Yeah. The counselor's name is Miss Miss Fent because she's out there swimming. Very cool. And then, do you have you got any girls that are your friends at school that are kind of cute? It's it's Shia. Shia? <laughs> she doesn't talk. <laughs> well, shout out to Shia, right? Shout out to all all the cool girls, right, in school? All, all the cool girls at school. Nice. Well, cool. So, so uh, resource teacher's name is Mr. Bloom. Very cool. Very cool. So, the art teacher's name is Miss Roach. Nice. So, the music teacher's name is Mr. Campos. Oh, very cool. Campos and Campos. Now, do you play music? Do you play any music? You play any instruments? Yes. What do you play? I play the drums. You play the drums or you just beat on things with your hands? Beat on things. <laughs> That's good. You got any music you like? What's your favorite music? My favorite music is... Is, is love, what? Love you, miss you, mean it. Luke Bryan. Oh, Luke Bryan? Very cool, man. That's good. And now... Um, any shout outs you want to give to any of your friends that are out there listening to this? Who are your friends you want to say hey to while you're on the air? I, I'm just gonna, I, I'm just gonna tell more. The PE teacher's Mr. B. Mr. B, huh? The library teacher's Miss Arth. How many years have you been going to this school? I, I, I start, I started lamping this year. Nice. So now you're at Lamping and you're looking forward to uh, getting through the fourth grade. What's your favorite subject? My favorite su subject to do math. Math. I know that you have a really good memory and you remember birthdays a lot, right? What, what's my birthday? June 6th. You're a rascal. You remember. I told it to you one time and now you remember forever. What's my brother's birthday? Do you know my brother's birthday? I don't know. If I tell you, will you remember George's birthday? It's May 23rd. Unbelievable. That's his birthday. Man, that's awesome. You got a great, you listen, you got a great memory. And I'm glad that you listened to the podcast. It makes uh, makes it fun for me to do, to know that you love when I say what? I said love to do the broadcast. Right. But what you like when I say what on the podcast in the beginning? What do we say? How do we start it? Go ahead and start it. Happy Friday, guys, and another Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bill T. <laughs> well, that's rad, man. Carson, I appreciate you for coming on the podcast, all right? Now, let's head back to the pool party and go do some swimming, huh? How's that sound? Good. All right, buddy. Until next week, say it. Later. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Volkswagen.